evidence concerning mixtures. Uh, for example, the mixture blood sample that uh, came from Ronald Goldman's uh, shoe. And uh, counsel, I reviewed the uh, case authority cited by the uh, prosecution yesterday, People versus Wash. I also reviewed the uh, NRC report again, section uh, dealing with the uh, mixed samples, and specifically the discussion that is approximately page uh, 55 to uh, page 75 of the NRC report. And what I would like is a, uh, out of the presence of the jury, an expert explanation as to how these auto rads are read with regards to these mixtures and what the uh, significance is and why or why I should not um, require a statistical analysis as is suggested by the NRC at page 59. All right, Mr. Uh, Clark, your evidence balls in your court. Yes. Dr. Cotton, then again, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Cotton. Your Honor, just for clarification, do you want this also to apply to the second mixture which they intend to introduce testimony of? Yes. Namely, steering wheel 29. Yes, right. 78 and 29. All right, good morning again, Dr. Cotton. You're reminded you're under oath for the purpose of this proceeding as well. Mr. Clark. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cotton, are you familiar with the issue that the court has framed and wishes you to address? Yes, I am. All right. With respect to, in particular, item number 78, the bottom of Mr. Goldman's shoe, did you perform RFLP typing on that particular sample that was provided to your laboratory? Yes, we did. In the course of that RFLP typing, what results did you obtain? We, we obtained a banding pattern that was clearly a mixture and how do you know it's clearly a mixture? The best indication from the banding pattern that it's a mixture is that the intensities of the bands in the pattern are different and there are more than eight bands in the cocktail and in the individual probes there is a, at least one probe where you see three so the total number of bands and the differing intensities of the bands confirms that, in fact, you have more than two people there. Your Honor, with the court's I mean, sorry, more than one person there. Your Honor, with the court's permission, could we illustrate that by use of the overhead yes, projector? Yes, I'd, I'd like to see the, uh, the auto red. Dr. Cotton, do you have the original auto red? Yes. That deals with item 78? been my next exhibit anyway. Shall we just go ahead and mark that as the people's next in order? Might as well. 257, I believe. All right, people's 257. But remark it in front of the jury so that they're yes. aware. yesterday in terms of marking the exhibits with respect to this particular auto rad there is what the witness has just described as a quote cocktail and then there are associated auto rads that basically look at the individual loci one at a time so would the court like that for instance marked 257 a through whatever I think that might be easier all right if it's associated to the same test I would assume that would be the most logical way to do it it is all right all right, Dr. Cotton, with regard to this particular test, that involved item number 78? That's right. Did it involve any other test samples, that is, evidence samples in this case, other than known samples? Yes, there are two other evidence samples displayed on this film. What items are those? They are item 52 and item number 12. All right, how many auto reds total are there in this one particular RFLP test? Seven. 
With respect to those auto rads, would it be appropriate to begin with what's been referred to as the cocktail auto rad? Uh, for this purpose, I would say yes. Okay. Then, Your Honor, if we could mark the cocktail as A. 257A. And then with respect to the remaining auto rads, do they then represent individual loci or individual genetic markers type one at a time? Yes. Are there names for each of those markers? Perhaps we can, would the court like the witness to describe what marker will we be, which marker C, and so forth at this point? You need to show me All why right. this comes in, so. Would it be appropriate to mark the first individual genetic marker test, MS1, as the letter B? Yes. Is MS1 simply the description of that particular marker? Yes. Would it be appropriate to mark as next in order that auto rad that deals with the probe MS31? Yes, but there are two of them, and you might want to distinguish, by, distinguish them by their development date. Okay. As far as C, then, what date should we attach to that? 10 11 94. And is that date actually on that particular auto rad? Yes. All right. And with respect to the second auto rad dealing with this genetic marker, MS31, what date is it? 11 1 94. All right. That'll be D. With regard to E, would it be appropriate that that be the particular genetic marker that is the auto rad? resulting from the test of the genetic marker MS-43? Yes. And that must leave us one genetic marker. Is that G3? No, we have two left. Okay. G3 and Y and H24. So F would be G3? Yes. And G would be Y and H24? Yes. Are these letters and numbers simply designations for these different genetic markers? Yes. All right. And with the court's permission, what I'm going to ask the witness to do is, first of all, to look at these auto rads in the order that they've been marked by projecting them on the Elmo machine and then having the court, I'm sorry, having the witness describe item 78 and its results. All right. Dr. But, Cotton. Uh, counsel, for the purpose of this hearing, what I'm interested in is how do we determine that it's a mixture? And then my next question is, once I come to the conclusion that there's a scientific basis for determining that there's a mixture, the next thing I'm interested in is why shouldn't I require a statistical analysis or statistical significance factor attached to that conclusion that the party relevant parties aren't excluded based upon the comments of the NRC at page 59? Okay. I'd like to see it. Okay. All right, Dr. Cotton, could we start with the cocktail then, exhibit 257A, I believe. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cotton, can you now see this particular auto rad 257A, the cocktail? Uh, yes, but it would be easier if I could come All down right. there. Then with the court's permission, could the witness come down so that she can, uh, and if necessary, she can view the projector screen and, if necessary, use the uh, point maker. <coughs> 
Now, Dr. Cotton, without getting into detail about exactly what's on this auto rad in terms of items other than 78 and the known samples, is this the particular auto rad that would have been the first one developed in your examination using RFLP typing of item 78? Yes, it was. Now, as far as the, re as the results that are shown there, do they demonstrate the existence of a mixture? For item 78, they do. How do you know that? If you count up the number of bands, uh, if I remember correctly, in this cocktail there are 11. The cocktail is a group of four probes. So if you expect to see two bands maximum with each of four with each probe, then for a single person with a group of four, you would expect to see eight. And here so we have 11. And here we have 11. And they appear to be of differing intensities. Yes, uh, you can see that the lower three bands are much different in intensity than the upper band, than the bands above them. And that is the second clear indication that you have a mixture there. Now, with regard to this initial autoradiograph, and you've described how you were able to determine a mixture, were you able to make any comparisons with known individuals who are also shown on this autored? There were, essentially, you're making comparisons with all the known individuals on the autored, and two of the known individuals on the autored are consistent with being contributors to item 78. Who are those two individuals? Uh, Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman. Now, with respect to these, and you've identified three lower bands as being less in intensity than the remaining bands? Yes. Are those based on this initial auto rad, and I'm referring to the three bands, the three less intense bands, are they attributable to one person or the other? Yes, they are, attribu they are attributable to uh, or consistent with uh, Mr. Goldman. Are they consistent or inconsistent, that is the three bands again, with Nicole Brown? They are inconsistent with Nicole Brown. Based on this first test or first typing process using this RFLP method, what conclusions were you then able to reach? For that sample, the conclusion would be that you do have two people there, and the possible contributors from the known individuals that we have would be the major amount of DNA coming from or consistent with Nicole Brown and the minor amount of DNA consistent with uh, some of the bands in Mr. Goldman's pattern. There are not all of his bands there. Uh, in this cocktail, there are only three. Is this feature of differences in intensity something that you've experienced in the past in your past in your casework? Yes, it's not at all unusual to see this kind of situation. Now, do you in fact go further and look at these genetic markers individually? Yes. All right. First of all, while the cocktail autorad 257A is on the projector, are there any further features about this autorad that are significant as far as determining the existence of this mixture and who may or may not have contributed to it? No, I think we've covered them. All right. Then, Your Honor, I'd like to use 257B if I could. Yeah. All right. That's Mr. Clark, at this point, I'm persuaded that there's a scientific basis for determining the mixtures here. And from what I've learned so far, there's a basis to determine that there's a, an ability to differentiate contributors. All right. All right. So let's, let's cut to the chase. Okay. Actually, perhaps I can do it in just a very short form by asking the witness, with respect to the remaining auto rads that deal with these genetic markers individually, what information, that is, what further information, if any, did they provide you in interpreting the existence of this mixture and who may or may not have been a contributor to it? In using the individual films, uh, there's a small additional amount of information. One is on the MS1 film, there are four bands seen. Two are consistent with Nicole Brown, and two are consistent with Mr. Goldman. And one of those bands that's seen on that film is not visible on this cocktail. 
that brings the total number of bands consistent with Mr. Goldman to four. And that is the total number of bands through all the testing on 78 that were consistent with Mr. Goldman. There is, I think if I remember correctly, one other piece of information on one of the other probes where you can, you see again one of the, the three bands that you saw initially and that may be um, the G3 probe, although I'd have to check to be sure. So you, like, you can identify one of the three bands from the cocktail as coming from a specific probe, um, one of them coming from MS1, one from another one, I think is G3. That leaves you a third band on that cocktail that you can't identify which probe it came from. And it adds, the MS1 individual film adds a fourth band, giving you a partial pattern of a second person. All right, perhaps you could retake the witness stand, Dr. Cotton and I'll. Right, Mr. Clark, let me interrupt you. Mr. Schumann, what article are you reading right now? Um, an article about the image. All right. I seem to see a picture of the defendant as you turned it over. Is that correct? Uh, yes. All right. While the jury is here, don't do that. Thank you. Mr. Clark. All right, Dr. Cotton. With respect to this mixture as you've described it, you ultimately rendered conclusions about item number 78 that you placed in your report. Is that right? That's right. What conclusions were reported? We reported that uh, the DNA banding pattern, uh, that the DNA banding pattern from item 78 consisted of two separate patterns. One matches uh, Nicole Brown, and there are four bands remaining. Those four bands match four of Mr. Goldman's pattern, and that Mr. Goldman could not be included or definitively included or definitively excluded as the donor of those additional four bands. With respect to the match between eight of the bands on item 78 and Nicole Brown, did you report a frequency to describe approximately how common or how rare those characteristics shared by item 78, that is those eight bands and Miss Brown were? Yes, we did. Did you also report an approximation of the frequencies of the characteristics shared by the additional four bands with Mr. Goldman? No, we did not. Why not? Because we only have four bands and clearly do not have a complete banding pattern, then the result is basically inconclusive with regard to Mr. Goldman. And we felt that based on um, our opinion that the result was inconclusive, an additional frequency for those bands would not be necessary. We wouldn't normally do that. Would it be, in your opinion, appropriate to report frequencies for those four additional bands that could have come from Mr. Goldman? There's nothing wrong with doing it. Um, it. It, however, in my opinion, regardless of whether or not you attach a frequency to those four bands, it is still an inconclusive result, and therefore attaching that frequency seems somewhat non-helpful. What kind of what frequency calculation did you make for Nicole Brown Simpson? We made a usual frequency calculation um, for all of the bands that are consistent with her using the frequencies for each band for each probe in the usual multiplication manner. and you probably heard the court address the NRC report and calculating frequency data? Yes. You have, well, first of all, you're familiar with the NRC report? Yes. And have you read it previously? I've read it many times. With regard to the, the NRC report <laughs> and its discussion of population frequency data, what does it say about calculating frequencies for a situation like Mr. Goldman's 
four banded pattern? Um, Mr. Clark, I didn't read that overnight, so I can't tell you exactly what it says. Okay. With respect to this type of reporting, in other words, should a frequency in your view be reported for this material, you've described how you didn't do that. You've described also the fact that it can be done. Let's shift your attention to PCR testing. First of all, was PCR typing conducted on material from this same stain? Yes. With what type of results, without getting into the actual numbers for each genetic marker, can you tell us what those results revealed? Uh, there's clearly a mixture based on the P PCR results also. And how do you reach that conclusion? Um, if I'm remembering correctly, for at least one of the markers, there are three alleles, and again, get more than two, there you have a strong indication you have a second person. Or more than one. Yes, or more than one, oh. sure. With regard to those, then, that mixture, were you able to determine whether or not individuals in this case, that is the known samples, any of them could be excluded or included? Yes, we were. With what results as to this particular item and based on PCR typing? Uh, the results um, are basically the same as the RFLP that uh, Nicole Brown and Mr. Goldman can be included. Uh, Mr. Simpson is excluded. As far as these individuals and their ability to be included, what about assigning population frequency estimates to that? How do you feel about that? Um, we didn't assign any population frequency estimates to that. They're, the signal on the dot plot are not sufficiently differentiated that you can say these two alleles must be from the major contributor and these and this other one or two from the minor contributor. You can't really tell that apart on the PCR result. So we didn't attach any frequency to the result at all. So this was a different situation than the RFLP results where there was clearly a difference in intensity. That's right. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? As far as these results, and let's take them in total now, the RFL re I'm sorry, RFLP results as well as the PCR-based results, do they provide you any additional information about whether or not it would be appropriate to basically sum up frequencies to describe the significance <laughs> of these mixtures or these alleles contained in these mixtures? Actually, it's a little easier, I think, to think about them separately as opposed to together. Okay. The PCR mixture, the signals indicate there's a mixture, but it's not, you can't differentiate one contributor from the other. In that case, it would not be inappropriate to basically take, do a calculation that says what's the sum of every possible contributor to this mixture. On the RFLP results, however, the signals are so well differentiated and that I think it would be um, very much understating the strength of the data to do that type of calculation for the RFLP result. Would it be understating it not to provide any frequencies to describe these mixtures or this mixture? I don't see any reason not to provide a frequency for the bands that are consistent with Nicole Brown, that they are so much more intense than the four additional bands. I don't see that uh, calculating a frequency for those four additional bands adds a lot and uh, that's just my opinion. All right. Thank you. Mr. Newfield, any questions? Yeah,
divisional? Woody, do the original on the cocktail. Just go there. Dr. Cotton, um, as a rule, um, at Selmark Diagnostics, when you receive samples to do DNA testing, you're limiting your assessment of the evidence to the, to the, to the DNA itself. Is that correct? Generally, yes. And you are there to basically do two things. One, determine whether bands are present or dots in the case of uh, PCR typing. And two, if they are present, to uh, estimate the frequency or rareness of that particular pattern. Is that correct? That's the um, normal progress of the analysis, yes. Well, I mean, you're not supposed to have any of the biases or other influences that, say, detectives working on the case would have. You're simply looking at it in a purely scientific fashion. Isn't that right? We're giving our estimation of what the data says. And when you look at the, and, and, and when you give your estimation of what the data says, you're to do that in a way that is not biased or influenced by other non-scientific evidence in the case. Isn't that right? Bill, this is not helpful to me. Right. Well, I, I, Your Honor, I believe actually it will be helpful to you because it will give you a context in which to understand Counsel, her I impression understand, of the autograph. I understand completely the context. I want to know why this is your motion to require the prosecution to provide statistical significance calculations for the mixtures. That's all I'm interested in. Okay. Can you please, um, Put up, light up the uh, cocktail. All right. Um, can you see it from where you are? I'd actually rather step down there if you don't Please mind. Please do. Right. Now, one of the things that you were talking about before under Mr. Clark's questioning was the disparity in the intensity of certain bands as a uh, as an indication of possible different sources. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Would you agree, when you look at the um, bands, first of all, in item 78, that if we count from the top, there's a, uh, it's difficult to see on the, on the overhead, Your Honor, but um, beneath the first band, are there two bands very, very close together? Yes. That appear almost as, as on, on the overhead, as, as a single, large blob, <laughs> so to speak. I don't think it looks like a single large blob. It looks like a, do you want me to use the pointer thing? Please do, that would be great. <coughs> or at least to please point out the two, the two bands that, that I'm referring to. Are you talking about these two right here? That's right. Okay. Um, I see two bands there. All or, right. And the upper one is less intense than the lower one and a little bit less intense than the very top one. Okay. And did you make a determination as to that the less intense band of the two bands that are very close together, whether that is consistent? consistent with bands for Nicole Brown Simpson or for Ronald Goldman? I believe on the, using the individual probes following the cocktail, that this band is uh, consistent with Nicole Brown. Okay. And um, would you agree that that light band is considerably less intense than the band directly beneath it? Yes. And the band directly beneath it is consistent with Ronald Goldman, is it not? No, I don't think so. You're talking about this darker one right here. Yes. I'll go across to the column which has Ronald Goldman's pattern in it. Yes. And do you see a band in approximately the same location? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, now, would you agree that there is differing intensity 
between the band that you just described as being above that band in, the, uh, in, in, lane, in item 78's lane and some of the other bands that you attribute to Nicole Simpson Brown, or you say are consistent with Nicole Simpson Brown. Yes. Okay. So in other words, even within the same individual, you are observing um, on this lane uh, bands of differing intensities. Isn't yes, that correct? Yes, that's right. And again, if you go down to the next band, uh, that's a band that you believe is consistent uh, or in the same position as, uh, as bands in Nicole Simpson Brown's lane? Yes. And then you go down one more, and that's another band that you believe is consistent with Nicole Simpson Brown? Yes. Sorry. And would you agree that that, that band that you attribute to Nicole Brown Simpson or say is consistent with Nicole Brown Simpson also has a differing intensity than other bands that you say are consistent with her profile? Um, it looks slightly different up here. Um, if, if you want me to give you the best judgment, uh, I might want to look at it here on the light box for just a Please second. Please do. Uh, rather than, I'd be happy to look at the copy as opposed to the okay. taking the original off the uh, thing. So now that you've had a chance to look at it on the light box, Dr. Cotton, would you agree that that other band that I just called your attention to, which you say is consistent uh, with bands coming from um, Nicole Brown Simpson, that that too is less intense than bands above and beneath it, which you also say are consistent with Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes, slightly. Okay. And now also, while you're there, could you take a look at uh, the lane next to it, item 52? Yes. You see that? All right. And a moment ago, you said that one of the... Um, Refresh my recollection. What is item 52? Item 52 is one of the drops at Bundy. Okay. In fact, it's the drop that's um, closest to the alleyway, Your Honor. Okay. So that's what they say it is. All right. All right. And um, item 52 in the banding pattern, you believe, represents DNA donated by one person. Is that correct? Yes. And would you agree that even though you say it's from one person, that as far as band intensity goes, that the bands, that the three bands, uh, the first three bands at the top are considerably fainter than the three lower bands? All right, Mr. Newfeld, what does this got to do with the mixture? Oh, what it has to do with the mixture is simply that one of the criteria that this witness was using to try and disaggregate the mixture and give, therefore, a frequency for a complete profile, as opposed to using the NRC method of aggregating those frequencies, was her opinion that you can rely on the fact that there's a differing intensity in the bands. Right. And so I'm just I've, I've, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That's what she said. All right. Well, no, that she said it, but what I'm saying is, is that the evidence here belies that position as a, as a criteria for making that distinction in a scientific fashion. That's the point. All right, anything else? Yes. Yes, witness. Now, you said that you are, you've read the NRC report many, many times? I have, but okay. I, I did not read it last night. All right, well, there is a sentence in the NRC report which says that if a suspect, and I quote, if a suspect's pattern is found within the mixed pattern, the appropriate frequency to assign such a match is the sum of the frequencies of all genotypes that are contained within the mixed pattern, unquote. All right? Yes. Number one, have you ever seen any scientific publication which contradicted that approach to aggregating um, genotypes for mixed stains? I don't recall seeing a specific scientific publication that has addressed that <coughs> issue other than the NRC report. So I take it then your answer is there's no scientific literature that you're aware of that would contradict? That I'm aware of. Okay. One moment, Your Honor.
And um, one last thing, uh, Dr. Cotton, just so I'm clear on this, by your own remarks uh, in response to Mr. Clark's questions, what you're saying is that uh, as to the PCR profiles, though, uh, you would agree that the appropriate approach is to um, aggregate those genotype frequencies? If one is going to put a number uh, associated with that data, then that would be the appropriate approach. Okay. By the way, no, nothing else. Thanks, Mark. Fine. Mr. Clark, anything further for Dr. Cotton? Yes, may I? Briefly. With regard to these PCR results, do you feel it's appropriate to assign numbers to mixtures? Objections to which he feels. Those are professional opinions, I, what I assume the question is. Yes, it's, it's, pro, it's perfectly appropriate. In terms of your actual reporting, why didn't you do that? We felt that simply stating that these individuals were not excluded was also an appropriate way to report that data. There, when you're reporting data, uh, there can be very legitimate differences from one laboratory to the next, and there are some things where there is no exactly right or exactly wrong way to do it. That was the method we chose. There's also nothing wrong with giving a composite frequency for all contributors to that um, or all possible contributors uh, to that set of types. Just with respect, and I'd like to direct your attention simply to the DQ alpha results on item number 78. Do you recall those? Um, if you, why, you can ask your question, but I might need to look at them. All right. Do you have before you, in one of your notebooks, the actual results, PCR-based DQ alpha results for item yes, 78? Yes. Are you thinking about looking at the strips or just looking at the types? Just the types that were detected. Okay. Okay, I've got the right page. Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'm simply going to ask, and I think the DQ alpha results are illustrative, ask the witness to write down where the summing process to occur, all of the different types that would be involved in it, because I think that's probative. All right. Briefly and quickly. Dr. Cotton, with regard to the DQ alpha results, can you describe for the court each of the various types that could have contributed to this sample as the court has expressed an interest in this type of summing process? Well, we can, we can give an example. If I miss a type somewhere in there, we'll have to let me think about it. But I'll sh get, I can give you the idea. OK. <clears throat> do you want me to just dis say it, or did you want to write it Actually, I was going to have you draw it on a diagram. Just I, I don't think you need to do that. Okay. I'll listen carefully. All right. Okay. With regard to the various types, would it then be the case, and first of all, what are the results on item 78, just DQ alpha? There's a 1.1, 1 .1, a 1.3, a 4, and there could be in there a 1.2, and you can't prove that it's there or prove that it's not there. For, so for purposes of this, it would be prudent to include that as a possible fourth type. So let's include the 1.2. So that's a feature of the DQ alpha testing process itself? That's right. You have <clears throat> to assume under certain circumstances that a type might be there. That's exactly right. Now, with regard to this summing process, are there then a number of different possibilities in terms of the types of people, of individual people, who could have contributed to that sample? Yes. Do you know how many? Um, no, I can't tell you how many right off the top of my head. And the other thing is that when you think about how many, wait, wait why don't you ask me again, because maybe I'm not getting what you're okay. asking. With regard to the field of possible contributors, and I'm only referring to different genotypes who okay. could have contributed to that sample, first of all, are there more than two possible 
types that contributed to that sample? Oh, there's many possibilities. Okay. When you say many, do you have an approximation of how many without sitting down and actually? Not, no. <laughs> okay. When you say many, are we talking more than two? Yeah, probably more than ten. And I believe you said there's, what, only 21 different genotypes to start with? That's right. Okay. Are there then a series of, of genotypes that may very well have absolutely nothing to do with the contribution to that sample? Yes, certainly. By summing all of those genotypes, is that, in your opinion, misleading at all? Objection A as to what's misleading. Oh. You mean by summing all the possible genotypes that could have contributed to this grouping of four, is that misleading at all? Well, let me ask it a different way. If one were to sum all of these genotypes to create a frequency, could you then end up with a frequency that's far more common than the truth is as far as that mixture is concerned? Objection is the truth. the question. All right. By summing all of those frequencies, could you then obtain a frequency that's far more common than the frequencies of the actual contributors to that stain? Of course. Is that in your view, well, do you believe the summing process then has a weakness as far as being accurate? The summing process gives you an extremely conservative idea of what percentage of the population could have contributed to these set of types. So in this summing process, are you including types that may have absolutely nothing to do with item number 78? Yes, you are. Uh, there's something else that n nobody's said here, and you, that is, when you do this summing process, you have to make an assumption, do I have two contributors? And then, based on two, you would sum everything up. If you said, well, maybe I have three contributors, and you summed from that perspective, then your frequency would be still yet more conservative. Or if you postulated four contributors. So in doing that summation and doing that calculation, you have to make some uh, assumption, I'm going to do the calculation based on two possible contributors, and then do it from there. If you did it based on three, it would give you a different result. And then in also in doing it, you would need to say, am I going to assume these people are uh, Caucasian or Hispanic or African American? And various combinations would also change the result. In your view, scientifically, is it scientifically appropriate to simply conclude from a mixture that you're unable to exclude an individual or individuals? Yes, I think that's scientifically appropriate. Anything else, Mr. Clark? And not misleading in any manner to do so? I don't think it's misleading. Clearly, if you say these two people can't be excluded, um, y you might also be saying other groupings of people can't be excluded also, if you get my. That is, you, if I was asked, can these two people be excluded, the answer is no, they cannot. Can other combinations of people also not be excluded? That the answer would be that's correct. They can't be other combinations of people can't be excluded either. In other words, you feel to describe it in that manner, not just that the people can't be or certain people can't be excluded, but others can't be excluded as well. That that's scientifically appropriate. It, certainly. All right. Briefly. Um, well, first of all, Dr. Cotton, if you have 21 genotypes and you know which alleles are not present, you could simply take all the possible um, heterozygous and homozygous frequent genotype frequencies for those alleles which are not present and add up the sum of those frequencies, could you? Yes, the ones that could be present plus the ones that couldn't be present equals the total. Exactly. So if you start out with 100% and you subtract the genotype frequencies which could not be present, which could not have contributed to that mixture, and you subtract that from 100%, you're left with some number, right? Yes. And that number is the same whether you have two contributors, three contributors, or 10 contributors. Isn't that right? 
I'm not so sure that that's right. Are you sure that it's wrong? No, some, some these, <laughs> these calculations, <laughs> sometimes I have to take a piece of paper and work on them and then answer that question. I'm not sure that it's wrong, but I'm not sure that okay. it's right. Sorry. And just getting back to one other point, other than the NRC report, which says that you indeed have to aggregate this data, you're aware of no authority to the contrary. You've already asked that question. Okay. Um, the only point I would make, Your Honor, is whether- We're not in argument yet. All right. Anything else? No. All right. Dr. Cotton, you can step down. All right, Mr. Clark, any comment briefly? Yes. Just briefly, Your Honor, I think under these circumstances, and as the witness has already noted, that under the specific circumstances of the testing involved, and we're looking at item number 78 in particular, that under those circumstances, particularly when one takes into account the RFLP typing pattern. Well, Mr. Clark, let me ask you this. Assuming that because of the manner in which Dr. Cotton just testified, that it's not inappropriate to testify both that these persons are not excluded and on cross-examination be cross-examined as to the population frequencies at, in an aggregate, don't we come to the same information you get to do your way on direct and they get to cross-examine? I think that goes back to the actual objection itself. The objection was to the board. And I think we need to put that back into its proper perspective. That was the objection. My intent is to ask the witness basically what the court just heard. Can you exclude these people? No, I can't. Are there also other types, you know, other groups of people that you cannot exclude? That's certainly true. They have different genotypes. And I think that's an appropriate way of characterizing it. And I think if the defense wants to, uh, elicit from the witness frequency data, summing it up and obtaining what are their numbers, they have a right to do that. Because I think that's generally direct examination and cross-examination. All right. Two things. Um, first of all, you sh I would note that I did have a chance last night to look at the cases that were cited by Mr. Harmon. And uh, neither of them stands for the proposition. I th you know that already? Right. I don't, I don't, did not find them to be germane. Okay, I agree. Um, your Honor, the, the issue here is not what the defense can do on cross-examination. The issue is, number one, what does the law of California compel? And number two, what does the scientific literature, which is unrefuted, state is, oblig is obligatory on the part of somebody trying to present data? And on both those points, there is unanimity that if they wish to present data. Well, Barney is dicta, counsel. It's not, I don't think it's Dick and Barney that, uh, that the, the DNA evidence without a number is meaningless. I think what they're simply saying is that statistics have to be reported. That's also the, frankly, when you read the NRC report, that's the, one of the most important reoccurring themes in the entire, uh, you know, 150 pages. Um, and no one's ever, no one's questioning that here. Um, your own ruling, in fact, explicitly so held uh, back in, in April. A, in a much different context. Well, the NRC report and Barney makes no distinction between mixed stains and, uh, and stains that allegedly come from a single source. More importantly, Your Honor, is what we're concerned with is how is the jury going to accept all this? And if on the one hand you have them describing numbers of 1 in 8 billion or 1 in 25 billion uh, for a particular profile where they say it's consistent with one person, and then in the very next box they describe a, a, a mixture and say that we can't exclude Mr. Goldman, or we can't exclude Nicole uh, Brown Simpson, um, the jury will make, will draw the logical inference that the same kinds of statistics apply there as well. It's not incumbent on me as a defense attorney to debunk that misstatement um, of the objective data. They have an independent duty not to mislead or confuse the jury long before we ever get to cross-examination. That's what Bonnie recognizes. That's what the NRC report recognizes. What Robin Cotton has told us is that, yes, those numbers can be calculated. And they can be calculated without, without a great deal of difficulty. With regard to the stain on the steering wheel 29, I sat down and did it in about 15 minutes. Certainly, they can do that for both item 78 and item 29. And those numbers can be presented to the jury. If they choose not to present the numbers, which is required by the report and, uh, and part of the decision in Barney, they should simply be precluded from putting on that, that evidence of those, those mixtures. The reason they don't wish to put on those numbers is they want to mislead the jury. If they didn't want to mislead the jury, they would do what is considered scientifically acceptable. 
Robin Cotton did not cite a single authority to say it's scientifically acceptable to put on uh, DNA um, evidence of a match in a mixed stain without reporting um, a frequency. That's the point here, and that's, that's the simple thing we're asking the court to decide and to compel the people to do. And if there's no authority to the contrary, I don't see why, either in logic or law, they should be allowed to do something which does have the effect of confusing and misleading this jury. That's all we're asking for. We're not saying they can't present any evidence of mixtures. Let them present them, but present them in a fair and impartial way. And what they're doing is misleading the jury. It's not fair. It's not impartial. I can guarantee you, the court, that there will be differences between the sides about what those numbers are. I don't think the matter is nearly as simple as Mr. Neufeld would have the court believe. That's the first observation. The second observation is, and it's interesting to hear the discussions about people versus Barney, because Barney appears to be dying under the weight of authority that's happened since then. As the <coughs> court provided to counsel today. Yes, the uh, Met News reports that uh, Barney is uh, mentioned disparagingly. And as was the case with conventional serology back in the 1980s when Mr. Harmon and I became involved in this area, it appears that by the weight of authority, again, courts are accepting the original testing the way it was done. So I think to use Barney in the context of a mixture or to use the NRC report in 1995 based on evidence provided in 1990, 1991, and early 92 to describe where we are today and to turn that into a compulsion that a witness provide a frequency that the court has already heard, she doesn't feel is, frankly, a perfectly fair way of approaching it, as opposed to describing the facts, that certain people are excluded, certain people are not excluded. And to allow the defense to elicit testimony in a manner that they feel is appropriate under these circumstances is, frankly, the criminal justice system by itself. All right. Just Thank you, counsel. No. Just course. in regard to the cases that you handed out today, I'd like to just comment on that and limit it to that. To the case that was uh, brought yeah. out today, all right, Edmondson. Just, just that, Your Honor, th those cases where they distinguish or talk about Barney are only talking about Barney's comments on the product rule versus the ceiling approach. There's absolutely no comment in any of those cases uh, disparaging the need to have some kind of statistical <laughs> significance to the meaning of a match, be it in a mixed stain or a single stain. And that's an important point here. That's what we're talking about. And I haven't seen any legal authority to the contrary on that. Mm -hmm. All right. The court's going to require the prosecution to present some type of statistical analysis with regards to the mixtures. All right, let's have the jury. Have a couple minutes if she could. Okay. Thank you. Since we've been at it uh, for a while. All right, we'll take a recess. All right. Based on the testimony of Dr. Cotton uh, yesterday, Your Honor, I believe as a matter of foundation, there's a foundation objection to her, uh, any testimony that she will give in the immediate future as to either a match or a statistical probability for items 78, 56, 52, 47, and 12 for the following reasons. But one thing they still have to, whether or not the, uh, the Fry issues were deemed waived by the court, uh, the foundation issues remain, uh, the fundamental foundation issues. And uh, they have to demonstrate, when a witness takes the stand, that they use the generally accepted methods in this particular case, in this particular instance. And um, well, we haven't we haven't gotten to there yet. Well, she did. She testified to the methods she used yesterday, Your Honor. And um, what she testified to was that they have three negative controls that they use in their casework. The first negative control being testing. I was here. I heard it. Okay. And what you should know is is that we now know from her direct testimony that one of those three negative controls wasn't used at all, namely on the substrates, that the reagent control that uh, is the very initial control that's used uh, failed with respect to uh, the various item numbers that I've just given, um, and that the amplification blank, which is the only remaining control, occurs further on down the line such that if the initial control fails, that trumps any subsequent control. So consequently, you have a failure of the controls or an absence of the controls, and you have the laboratory in this particular case not using the generally accepted methods to arrive at a result. And so on purely foundation grounds, mm -hmm. we would object to the introduction of any evidence as to those particular items. Mr. Clark? Yes, I think the 
testimony has already demonstrated. The witness described the procedures used. They were correct procedures in her opinion. And in fact, as I think the testimony will demonstrate, well, already has demonstrated, that complies with the court's order dated several weeks ago about what was necessary in terms of a foundation and the use of correct procedures. The witness has described her opinion, and the court has heard no contrary evidence to this point. All right. The objection is overruled, subject to a motion to strike at a later time. All right. Let's have the jury. Presented to you, so I apologize to you for the delay in getting started. We also had a hard time rounding up all the necessary parties before getting started this morning. Uh, also, I understand we had some modifications to Cinema 1 and Cinema 2. <laughs> all right. I take it they're, accept they're acceptable? All right. You might want to write a thank you note to the king. Also, uh, Council, uh, I have uh, modified the jury box slightly. I've asked everybody in row number one to slide down one seat so that juror number one is protected by the monitors from the errant <coughs> display boards. All right, that's for juror number one's protection. All right, Mr. Clark, you may resume. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Cotton, just briefly, you had described the fact that Dr. Blake had actually performed this cutting process on, I believe it was six of the evidence items yesterday? Yes. With regard to those cuttings, were you present when they took place? Yes, I was. And observed what took place? Yes. In your opinion, did Dr. Blake do anything that might contaminate those samples by his cutting process? No. Now, have you since we broke yesterday, had an opportunity to look at one of those boards that I showed you yesterday that dealt with the chain of custody of certain items received in your laboratory? Yes, I have. All right. Referring you to that board that's marked People's Exhibit 209, did you have a chance to look at, in particular, the four items that have your laboratory's name labeled at the far right, which are items 7, 12, 49, and 56? Yes, I did. And does that board <clears throat> accurately reflect your laboratory's receipt of those four items on the day after the date on the board, which in the case of each of the four is April 3, 1995? Yes, our records reflect that we received them the day after the date on the board. All right, very good. Now, Dr. Cotton, if I could, and I believe we were about to get started on that when we recessed yesterday. With respect to the auto rad that has already been marked, People's Exhibit 246, and which we have made copies or had prepared copies for each of the jurors, which I believe are marked, People's Exhibit 256. That auto rad, in fact, contains the known DNA from the three parties in this case. Is that right? That's right. That would include Mr. Simpson? Yes. Nicole Brown? <clears throat> yes. And Ronald Goldman? Yes. All right. Does that auto rad demonstrate any differences in their DNA patterns? Yes, it does. Does that auto rad also have a particular item of evidence that was tested at the same time? Yes. What item is that? Uh, I believe it's item 56. Is that a shoe print or other? I, I'm sorry, is that actually a bloodstained shoe print? That's what uh, you have conveyed to me. Now, Your Honor, it would be my request to hand out, re hand out these copies for each of the jurors so that they can utilize that during the witness's testimony about this particular x-ray. Yes, proceed. the 
earlier marked one 246. I'm wondering if perhaps it's in the pile with 256. I don't think so. I just sent Mrs. Robertson on another errand, so. All right. 256? 246. 246. Mrs. Robertson has the original. Thank you. Dr. Cotton, what I'm going to ask you to do, and first of all, have you had an opportunity to see what these x-rays look like when they're projected onto the upper screen? Yes, I have. With respect to 246, then, would it assist you in describing the results on this particular x-ray to have it on the screen so that you can point out certain things? Sure. All right. With the court's permission, then, I'd like to display people's 246. Proceed. And Dr. Cotton, can you step down here and would that aid in your ability to point out particular items on this particular x-ray as well as by using the point maker? Yes, and um, maybe if we have one other copy or the original, we could lay it on the small light box also. All right. Let me l ask you a couple questions. You have the original x-rays in this case? I have the original autorads in this case. And when we say autorad and x-ray? <coughs> Is that the same thing? Yes. Okay. You have the originals, and then have there been copies provided to both sides in this case? Yes. All right. With respect to these originals versus the copies, what differences are there, if any? The copies may have, um, for the most part, there's no differences. When a band is very light, uh, the copy may not show that band quite as clearly as the original. And the only way to determine that is to hold them side by side and see if you can see it as clearly on a copy as you can on the original. All right. Do we have, in fact, a small light box also in court on council table? Yes. And would it assist you to use that light box to look at the original just in case there are any differences between the original and the copy? Well, actually, what I'm concerned with is how it looks up on the screen as opposed to how it would look on the light box. So All right. that's why that helps me to have the light box there. Then with the court's permission, we will adopt that procedure and be able to display to the jury on the projection screen itself. All right. Proceed. All right, Dr. Cotton, if you could, could you obtain the original of what's been marked, not only People's 246, but also the copies, People's Exhibit 256? Here is the original for this film. permission, prior to discussing, and there aren't very many samples on these auto rats, I'd like to at least show briefly to the jury the particular item of evidence that's been described by previous witnesses. Are referring specifically to 56? Exactly. And I believe that particular photo board is Exhibit 165. All right. Your Honor, I would only make an objection subject to a clarification from the court that, again, on the uh, on the chain of custody, that she's not testifying that it's that item. Correct. I would just simply ask for that instruction from the court. I think that's apparent already from the testimony. I'm sorry. It's apparent already from the testimony.
specifically on this exhibit, Your Honor, which I believe is People's Exhibit 165, in particular to the photograph on the top row, three photos from the left, labeled item number 56. Now, Dr. Cotton, with regard to this particular x-ray, first of all, is this an x-ray that was developed following your use of this RFLP typing process? Yes, it is. Okay. Could you describe for us what this x-ray shows in broad terms? In other words, how is it oriented, what are the samples on it, and so forth? Okay. Let me just start with telling you that this is the right way to hold it. The dark lettering, or the dark background to the lettering at the top, you want to be up. The lettering across the top is simply the number of the gel that these samples were loaded on. F is on there because it's a forensic case and not a paternity case. If it was a paternity case, that would be a P. 080994 is the date the gel was run on, and 15A is simply the number of the gel tank that the gel was run on. And this lettering is actually essentially burned into the film. That is, it's exposed at the time the film is made. So it can't be erased or taken off in any way, and this is our permanent record that this film goes with a particular case. Now, on your films, although it's not shown on the screen, you can see that there's handwriting at the bottom, and that handwriting at the bottom is written on here by the analyst who's doing the test, and he or she is taking that record from the case folder where it's listed the order that the samples were loaded into the gel, and so these are our sample numbers across the bottom, and then the case number and the gel number is written again, and then you see the letters SLC. That refers to the fact that this film is made with a group of probes, and in the lab we call it a cocktail, so that stands for single locus cocktail. The reason, if you remember in the examples that we've talked about so far, we keep talking about for one genetic location you'll see two bands. Well, obviously here, and now you can sort of move to the screen, you see that there are multiple bands in many of the lanes here, and that's because four different probes were added to this film. This is done in our lab. It's the first addition of probes, and then, and we haven't mentioned this before, once you add probes to a membrane and you allow them to bind and you get your x-ray film off, you can strip those probes away without removing very much of the DNA on the membrane and come back and then do another probe on that membrane, get another film, finish that, strip that probe off, and come back and do it again. And depending on the amount of DNA that you have on that film, you may be able to do that many, many times. Let me stop you for a moment, Dr. Cotton. When you've described that this particular x-ray includes four different probes done at once, why do you do that? Why don't you just do one at a time? If we are comparing evidence samples and known samples and the evidence and the knowns are not consistent, that is, the known people that we have for a case are excluded from being donors of the evidence, that becomes apparent immediately on having a group of four probes like this. So it allows us, if in fact the result is an exclusion, it allows us to see that very clearly right away. We report that right away, and then we don't go on any further unless we're requested. And we've done our films in the lab this way from the beginning. Most other labs just do them one at a time. This is an instance where there isn't a right and a wrong. This isn't better or worse than anybody else's. It's just customary at Cellmark. Okay, so the next important thing to notice, and I'll go to the pen here. Okay. 
this lane on the far left, the second lane in, this middle lane, and the two lanes on the right are what are referred to as markers. They are one of the, one of the types of controls that's on an RFLP test. Each, let's talk about this marker first because it's the easiest to visualize. Each one of these bands is from a DNA fragment whose size is exactly known. The marker is purchased from a biotechnology company and although I'm not going to remember the exact sizes, I could easily go look them up. And in, as a very close approximation, this band is 2,000 base pairs. This one is 3,000, whoops, let's undo that. So we have two, three, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 up here, 8,000, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The purpose of that marker is to later on use that with the computer imaging system to help make an estimation of the fragment sizes in the other samples. And as long as we're talking about that, let's just use an example. If this is two, and this is three, and this is four, this band in Mr. Goldman's pattern is clearly between three and four. And remember that what we're concerned about is the samples were loaded across the top here uh, in about the same positions as, as the bottom of each of the labels, approximately. And the DNA from each sample moved through the gel down in this direction, and the smaller pieces would move faster and further through the gel than the longer ones. And that's illustrated again by the marker. Here's this, this, this lowest one is about 1,600 and then 2,000 and so on. So by eye, you can make an estimation that this lowest band in Mr. Goldman's pattern is somewhere between 3,000 base pairs and 4,000 base pairs. Now the computer system can actually do measurements, the measurements reflect the distance migrated through the gel, and the computer system will then do a calculation that'll give you a more precise estimate that you can do just by eye. You don't have to have a computer system to do it. You could measure them yourself and plot it out on a piece of graph paper, and your answer would still be quite good. The second marker up here, well, let me go back to the labels. Th this marker is labeled 1KB. It stands for one kilobase. That is, each of the bands in that marker is 1,000 base pairs larger than the band below it. The second marker is a viral DNA that's commonly used as a marker. It is labeled lambda. And really, we're only using this top band as a to give us a band that's larger than 12,000 base pairs. And this top band in lambda is approximately 23,000 base pairs. So this, the combination of this 23,000 base pair and the 1 KB marker is what we're using to estimate sizes. There are two additional <coughs> samples on this film that do not relate specifically to this case. One of them is over here. It's labeled TDS on your film. It is uh, DNA from a blood sample from one of the lab staff at Cellmark. Uh, this person um, has been gracious enough to provide us a blood sample every uh, four or six months or so, and we have been using his blood sample as a control sample for a long time. We know exactly what his pattern should look like, Exa uh, and we have many measurements of the sizes of the DNA bands in that pattern. And that's an example 
of one of the controls that I mentioned the other day where we know what this pattern should look like. Should it look different than usual, we would, that is, should the band sizes be different than usual, um, that would be of concern to us. Do you ever have to tra track that person down when you're running low? Well, he's pretty cooperative. Um, the, and the same goes, uh, this, the same scenario is true for the two markers, the lambda and the 1KB. You can see that this 1KB marker has a very typical appearance with the distance between adjacent bands getting shorter and shorter and shorter as you go up the gel. If that marker didn't have that very typical appearance, it would tell you immediately that something was wrong with the gel that, that you were, had used. And so that's just another indication or another example of what I meant when I said you get accustomed to looking at these, you know what they should look like. It's been described either by uh, many measurements or by use in many labs over time, for example, for the marker, that this is what it should be like. There is another control on this film. It's labeled K562. It is DNA from a cell line um, that you can purchase. And it is a commonly used control in forensic casework for labs all over the country. This control became available after we had already um, been using the control from a person in our laboratory. We include it on all of our, or some of our gels. It may not be on each one, but when there's room for it, we will run that as well. The three remaining lanes um, contain the known samples from Mr. Simpson in this lane, from Nicole Brown in this lane, and from Ronald Goldman in this lane. Let and, me stop you for a okay. moment. I'm sorry, Dr. Cotton. With regard to that K562 lane, could you point that out again? Right here. All right, and could you explain just briefly again, what's the purpose of that particular sample? That sample is simply another controlled DNA whose pattern, now that we've run it a number of times, is recognizable. We do not, in our lab, have standard sizes for this lane yet. We have still are accumulating numbers for that. So we're not using it. Um, in exactly the same way we're using the TDS because we do have standard sizes for that. So we're accumulating those standard sizes, but the pattern does look as it's supposed to. Now, as to a number of these samples, whether it's the Lambda, the 1KB, the TDS, referring to the first three lanes on the left, and then the k 5 well, and the additional 1KBs in the middle and off to the right, as well as the K562. If something goes wrong or doesn't appear correct when you're reading this result, does that kind of turn on a light in your head or what? It, it alerts you to the fact that something might be wrong. Now, it could be that something's just wrong with that standard sample and that you can demonstrate that. But it also tells you something could be wrong with the standard samples and the, and the gel run in that particular case, which then would affect all the samples. So if anything doesn't look right, you would go in and figure out what was the problem. Did it affect all the samples in that gel run? Or is it specific to that particular standard? If possible, even if it was just specific to the standard, you could go back and rerun them. Sometimes if we have a problem with a standard and we can't rerun the evidence, and actually, I don't want to be, be confusing. I'm using standard, I see, two ways. Usually, the, if it's a known sample, I'll try to call it a known sample from a known person. If it's one of our standard markers or the TDS, I'll, refer, I'll try to remember to refer to it as a standard sample in the lab. If we had problems with a standard sample such as TDS and we couldn't rerun the evidence, we might rerun the standard 
and the known samples from that case to make sure that, the all e that everything was reproducible. So a problem with a standard doesn't mean you have to dismiss all of the results, but it does mean that you better look at them closely and make sure that everything is okay. Okay, referring you if I can, and let's start with this first lane that's labeled lambda. Why is it the bands that are shown there seem to be smaller than the bands in the next lane over, the 1 kb? Is smaller the right word or not? Are you, uh, okay, you're asking me why are these bands narrower from top to bottom than these bands in the 1 kb lane? Yes. There are two things that can affect that. One is that there may be more DNA in the 1 kb lane more total DNA in that lane than in the lane that has lambda DNA. We are loading standard amounts. I think that the amount of lambda that's loaded may be less, but I'd have to go into the protocol to confirm that. The other thing that, when you look at this kind of difference, whenever you're looking at a a larger band versus a smaller band, or a dark band versus a light band. There are many things that can affect that. It, it is a technical enough procedure that a single explanation may not be the only contributing thing to making something darker or lighter. In this case, the answer to your question is there are two possible contributing things. One is that there's less DNA in the lambda lane than the 1 kb lane. And the other would be that the amount of P32 in the probe for the 1KB was more than the amount of P32 in the probe for the lambda. And, and that's something that can also affect how dark or light a particular band is. As far as this difference in the darkness and lightness and the narrowness of the bands, does that make any difference in your ability to interpret results? On, on this film, in this example, it wouldn't make any difference at all. It certainly can make a difference. Bands can be very light. Uh, bands can be very dark and close together such that you can't make an absolute distinction of whether there's a single band or two very close together. So it can make a difference, but it's not really making a difference um, on these markers. Let me give you a better example. Let's come over here. The, you can see that this band in the K562 lane, can I make that stay there? No. What am I doing wrong? How do I make it stay there? Oh, by pushing the button. Like oh, that. right, the button. Uh, there we go. Okay. That band is more intense than the two bands above it and the bands below it without going back and looking, I can't remember, but it could be that for the cocktail, there are actually two bands there, one identified by one probe and one identified by another, so that you see basically overlapping bands. And that's, and it, I'm just making this up as an example, that's another reason why a band might be darker than the bands above it or the bands below it. How do you answer that question, or do you answer that question that you just asked in the course of your further testing? Yes, because as you go through and do each individual probe by itself, you can then, in doing that, see if we can undo this arrow. Let's, this is, okay. Let's say we went and did each individual probe by itself, and we identified that this band and this band came from the first probe. And then, let's say we went back and did another band, I mean, sorry, another probe, and we identified that this band and this one over here came from probe number two. Then you could go back and do another hybridization. 
and we might see that on the third probe, that identified this band and this one, and go back then and do the fourth probe that's part of the group, and perhaps the fourth probe would again identify this band and this remaining band. So in the process of doing them each individually, you can define of the pattern that you see which bands came from which genetic location. The cocktail is great for telling people apart. You can see here that clearly Mr. Simpson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Goldman all have different overall patterns. To establish more information than that, it's desirable to go back and necessary to go back and do each probe individually. Now, we didn't do that on this film because the evidence lane doesn't have a banding pattern, so I can't show you that. But on the other films, we did do that. All right, we'll return actually to both of those things, the actual evidence on this x-ray as well as uh, the fact that you did these probings individually on other x-rays as well, or other x-rays in addition to that. One more question about generally about this x-ray itself. There appears to be some darkening between the bands, for instance, on the third lane labeled TDS. Is that correct? Over here, you're yes. talking about this background in here? As well as in, for instance, the sample that's labeled N Brown at the top as well. Yes, right here, all and, of this. And to some lesser extent in uh, what looked like at least two others of the lanes or perhaps three as well, is that right? Yes. What is that? That is the background that you see as DNA becomes degraded. The more degraded the sample is, the darker this general background becomes. And the longer the exposure, that is the longer the x-ray film has laid over the membrane to expose, the darker this background will become. Does that affect your ability to interpret results, the fact of this background? I've certainly seen DNA patterns where the degradation was so substantial that it basically obliterated your ability to see any bands. For the most part, even if there is degradation, you can still see where the bands are because they're superimposed over it and they are still darker than the background. It can affect your ability to read it. It doesn't all the time. Does it affect your, the accuracy of the results themselves? As long as it doesn't affect uh, the ability of the computer imaging system to choose where that band is or your ability to assess that the computer imaging has chosen the band position correctly, then it, it generally won't affect the results. But if it's dark enough, it will. Can it, for instance, turn one type into looking like a different type? No, it doesn't do that. So in other words, this part of the testing process doesn't affect your ability to accurately type samples. Does that question make sense? No. OK. I will draw that. Thank you. Area I'd like to ask you about, Dr. Cotton, is you describe briefly how it can be seen that the samples from the three known individuals, Mr. Simpson, Nicole Brown, and Ronald Goldman, have different overall patterns. Can you describe that and show that for us, please? Okay. V, let me just take a look at the light box. Remember that we're making the assessment 
of a pattern by looking at the position of each of the bands as they are distributed from the top to the bottom. So uh, let's just say we have, we have these three people here. Uh, Mr. Simpson has three bands that are close together that are almost uh, near the top of the 1 kb ladder. Let me stop you for just a moment, Dr. Cotton. Perhaps you can clear all of those arrows that you've already done off uh, to the right. OK, there we go. Thank you. He has three additional bands uh, lower down. And although you can't see it very well on this screen, there is uh, an additional band down here, which I had to check on the light box to make sure that I remembered that there was one down there. <coughs> This isn't, this isn't necessarily the optimal way of viewing these, and in the laboratory you would just look at it on the light box and make your decisions based on how it looked laid on the light box like I have it over at the table. So if you make a comparison, um, we'll just compare Mr. Simpson's pattern to uh, the TDS pattern. The TDS pattern also has some close groupings of bands but they are not in the same position as the groupings that Mr. Simpson has. This lower grouping down here, there's no bands at all. So this pattern is clearly different from the TDS pattern. Let me stop you for a moment, Dr. Cotton. With respect to Mr. Simpson's DNA, we see what appear to be a grouping of three bands, and then a little lower down, another grouping of three bands. And then you described further on, almost all the way down, uh, this x-ray as we can see it, then a light band. What can you tell us about why that band would be lighter? We know from many, many, let me just, uh, let me put an arrow right here where I think that light band is. And actually the TDS pattern also has a light band. And that one is right here in a slightly different position. We know from understanding the gel and understanding how the radioactivity or the, the probe DNA that's radioactive binds that in this system and some other systems, but I'll, I'll just refer to the Cellmark system, when a band is very small, it tends to be lighter. You can see that in the TDS control it, and you can see that in Mr. Simpson's pattern. One of the reasons for that is that the total number of repeats in that small band, remember the length of the band is defined by how long that repeating sequence is, and the probe is going to bind to that repeating sequence. The total number of repeats available for a probe to bind in a very small band is substantially fewer than a band that is more sizable. That's just another example of a technical reason why you might see bands that are different, differing in intensity. Incidentally, does Mr. Goldman also have a similar band in that range? Yes, he does. Perhaps you could point that out. That would be right there. Now, with respect to those lighter bands, how do they affect, affect your ability to type results accurately? The largest problem that you might have is that you may have two samples that have the same pattern, a known and an evidence. And if you have less DNA for, let's say you have less DNA in the evidence than you do in the known, you can see that if we have, if you get, if it gets very much lighter, that is those lower bands, if they got very much lighter, you wouldn't be able to see them. So it does happen occasionally that you might be missing a lower band such that your evidence, say, had eight, Sorry, let's say your known had eight, and the eighth one was down in this region of the gel, or maybe even in this region. And the evidence only had seven. 
and didn't have one in that region. And that leaves you with two explanations. Either the DNA has in the evidence actually may have all the bands, but you can't see one, or the DNA in the evidence is not, could not be from the same person as the DNA in the known. And, and you would have to then make some decision about interpretation of that seven, of those seven bands as compared to those eight bands. Now, Dr. Cotton, with respect to these three samples, whether it's Mr. Simpson's, Nicole Brown's, or Ron Goldman's, those are known samples. In other words, to your knowledge, it was identified where they came from. Yes. In other words, they came from known individuals. Yes. Now, I believe I interrupted you when you were describing the differences in the overall patterns of the three individuals. Or had you finished? Well, you could do more. I don't. <laughs> Next question. Yes, uh, definitely, Your Honor. Now I'd like to turn your attention, Dr. Cotton, if I can, to the sample or the lane, which looks like it's the, the fifth one from the left that's labeled number 56 print. Okay. With regard to that sample, and again, that stain was put through this RFLP typing process, correct? Yes, it was. What kind of results do you see from that particular sample? Zero. I don't see any. What does that mean? It means that... It, it, there was DNA in that sample, and that DNA was loaded on this gel. It means it, that the DNA that we loaded on the gel was not human DNA. The probes are specific to human DNA, and because we got no banding pattern at all, and there was a substantial amount of DNA from that sample, that the DNA from, that we obtained from that sample wasn't human DNA. We have no banding pattern and no conclusion can be made regarding that sample. All right, Dr. Cotton, I'm going to ask you several questions about that particular sample, but I believe you could answer those from the witness stand if that okay. would be more comfortable. Available? Yes, I believe so. And this would be 258? Or have we numbered this yet? Uh, this, I believe, is already, already marked as people's 45J. 45J. Now, Dr. Cotton, with respect to item 56, before you actually had this sample tested using the RFLP process, I'm going to clear the arrows. Do you go through a particular step with a sample to try to determine if there's human, I'm sorry, if there's DNA present, and if so, approximately how much? Yes. How do you do that? After the DNA extraction and before you do the next step, which is the restriction cutting of the DNA. You take a very small portion of your DNA and run it on a very small gel. It's about, oh, three inches by four inches, two inches by three inches, something like that. And what that allows you to do is determine whether the DNA is in pretty good condition or whether it's degraded or somewhere in between and it allows you to make a rough estimation of how much you have. And it doesn't tell you whether it's a mixture and it doesn't tell you whether it's human. It just tells you whether you have some DNA there. And did you perform that particular step with regard to this item number 56? Yes, we did. What did it tell you? I would check, just ask for the instruction. We haven't established the connection 56 to this item yet. So I'll take that as an objection subject to motion to strike. Right. right. Proceed. With regard.
regard to this particular item that was provided to you, item number 56, what were the results of this test to determine how much DNA was present? Uh, again, objection to the same reasons. Same ruling. Right. Proceed. When we ran the DNA obtained from item 56 on the mini gel, there was clearly uh, DNA there, and it appeared to be in good condition. What does that tell you about your ability to then type that DNA? Right then, it doesn't tell you anything. Okay. Does the result of that test affect what further steps you take in terms of typing that sample? Well, it certainly can if you have very little DNA or it's very degraded at that juncture, then you might decide that it's not of sufficient quantity and quality for RFLP and that you should then go on and do PCR. So in other words, you use this step as sort of a guide as to which typing approach, RFLP or PCR, would be the more likely to produce results that give you information. That's right. With regard to this particular item, did you make a determination of which approach then to try, RFLP or PCR? We made a determination to try RFLP, and <coughs> we knew that we had enough sample left over to do PCR, so we went ahead uh, clearly from the film um, that we shouldn't have I mean, shouldn't have. It doesn't matter that we did it, but it didn't give us any result. Did the fact that it produced no RFLP result, was that something you expected, or was that a surprise of any sort? Well, that was sort of a surprise. Um, what I haven't mentioned, uh, it, there is also a test you can do to determine whether you have human DNA. So you could do both your mini gel and a test to determine whether you have human DNA. And we routinely do that for PCR samples. We did not do it for this sample before the RFLP. So we did do it later on. So because we hadn't done it, we didn't know that that wasn't human DNA, and we did proceed with an RFLP analysis. Now, you described <coughs> earlier <coughs> the role that bacteria can play in terms of degrading human DNA. Is that right? Yes. With regard to this particular instance, to what extent can you offer an opinion about the possible role of bacteria? If there was originally human DNA present in that sample, it is substantially degraded and not able to give any, it's so degraded that no RFLP pattern could be obtained. And to what extent, if any, does, I'm sorry, does bacteria play a role in that or could play a role in that? Well, it can play a role in that. If a sample is deposited on a surface that has a lot of bacteria, then the bacteria may participate in the degradation of that DNA. Bacteria contain many enzymes many proteins that will break up DNA in a random manner. And therefore, when, a, when bacteria is present, <coughs> DNA degradation occurs. Now, did you subject this same material provided as item number 56 to you to PCR typing? Yes, we did. Did you obtain results? I believe we did. Can you verify that from the materials sure. that you have? Yes, we did obtain uh, PCR results from that sample. Do those results then allow you to make any conclusion about whether or not there is human DNA in this sample? Yes, they do. Why is that? The PCR test also is pretty much considered to be human specific. That is, it will recognize human DNA and uh, you might be able to type a primate like a champion, champ chimpanzee or a gorilla, but you can't type uh, other animals. So the fact that we got a PCR type uh, from that sample is a very good indication that there was human DNA present. 
So then is it the case with respect to your RFLP typing that produced no result? That doesn't mean there was no human DNA in that sample. That's right. In, what it means is that the DNA was so degraded that it was incompatible with giving an RFLP result. As far as bacteria are concerned, do bacteria result in changing the type of the sample? For instance, if bacteria was present in item number 56? It won't change the type to appear to be another person's type. There is a level of degradation that you could, that you could have in your DNA sample where you would begin losing bands and you begin losing them at the top. In, in a, not exact, it's not the same as the description I just gave you of not being able to see a band at the bottom, but the phenomenon, the result of the phenomenon is the same. You might have a known sample that had eight bands. You might have an evidence sample that was degraded and had six bands that were consistent with the known, but two bands in the known wouldn't, may not be visible in the <coughs> evidence. You would come to, the, you would have the same, anytime you're missing bands at the top end or the bottom end of a pattern, you have the same decision tree in terms of conclusions. It's either consistent with that person or it's inconsistent with that person, um, but basically would have to be from a close relative. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is shift your attention, Dr. Cotton, to a second series of x-rays that you created after testing other evidence. First of all, you have, do you not, with you, x-rays of other RFLP tests in this case other than 56? Yes. Incidentally, with regard to item number 56 and that first auto x-ray, I'm sorry, that you've been showing on the board, did you then, in the case of that sample and those three knowns, go through this process of doing one probe at a time, creating additional x-rays? Not with that film. Why? Because there was no, since there was no evidence, I mean, since there was no information obtained from the evidence, we didn't go through the process of doing each probe by itself because there's just no DNA there from the evidence, so there's no, nothing to be gained by doing that. So there's no reason to go further with regard to that sample? That's right. Now, did you also receive, well, let me rephrase that. When you conducted this RFLP typing, again, did you do it on other samples in addition to 56? Yes, we did. Did those include samples that you actually obtained RFLP typing results for? Yes. In particular, did you test on one x-ray what included items number 52? Yes. Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'd, I would ask that a photograph of 52 be placed on the Elmo as well. Which is, I am told, Exhibit 48I. And in particular, Your Honor, with regard to the board, which has been marked, I'm talking about the photo board that's on the easel currently. It's People's Exhibit 165. In particular, the photograph labeled on the left-hand side of that board, three photos down, labeled item number 52. Was that one of the items tested during this RFLP typing process, Dr. Cotton? Yes. On this particular test, or during this test, did you also test any other items in this case? Yes. What were those items? Item number 78 and item number 12. All right, what I think we'll do is take them one at a time. Do you have with you the first x-ray in this testing process for those items you've just described? Uh, yes. Would that be what you called the cocktail x-ray or cocktail auto red? Yes, but I'm going to have to find it.
was hoping that you did because I wasn't seeing it in this group. Incidentally, is that the original of that particular x-ray? It sure is. How are you able to tell that's an original instead of a copy? Um, sometimes the copies are a different color, but these recent copies are not, and they're so close to the originals that what I'm doing is feeling for the labels that are stuck onto the originals, and I can feel that this has the labels on it, and so I can really quickly say this isn't the copy. All right. With respect to this particular cocktail x-ray, I'd ask that that be marked as People's Next in order, Your Honor. People's 258. Did we pre-mark this already? I'm sorry, that has been marked, Your Honor. That's 257A. All right, 257A. Now, Dr. Cotton, with regard to the samples that were tested on this particular x-ray, would it again assist for you to use the overhead projector as well as the pointing machine? Sure. All right. All right, Dr. Cotton, if you can, can you describe for us what's shown on this particular x-ray? What are the samples? Do you want me to list the controls as well? If you can, just describe them briefly and answer whether or not they're the same controls or the same types of controls used on the earlier x-ray. The film is laid out in terms of where the samples were loaded on the gel in a similar manner to the one that you saw previously. So that we have marker lanes on the left, two marker lanes on the right. They're the same markers as before. All the films have the same markers, the lambda and the 1KB. The reason that you can actually see the markers is that a probe is also added that identifies the markers because the markers are not from human DNA and if you didn't add a probe specifically for them you wouldn't be able to see them. There's also an additional marker lane in the center, another 1KB ladder. There is a TDS standard over here. This standard shows some degradation and again what as you view it on the light box as opposed to viewing it on this screen there it's not this dark. Uh, the same is true with some of these lanes over here when you look at it on the light box. It's a little bit easier. There is also a K562 lane on this film that's shown right here. There, are The three known samples um, are here, Simpson, Brown, and Goldman. The three evidence samples are loaded over here, number 52, number 78, and number 12. Now, with regard to, and you've identified or described the fact that the three known samples are towards the right of that x-ray, is that right? That's right. And they have created certain banding patterns, is that correct? That's right. Now, with regard to those lanes, and let's look at, for instance, what's labeled Nicole or N. Brown, that lane appears to be dark. Can you describe what causes that? This sample uh, has a considerable amount of degradation in it. That was seen as early on as the mini gel when we looked to see how much DNA we got from that sample. 
you can see on the mini Jala that DNA is degraded. The same is actually true for the sample from Mr. Goldman, although on this particular film, the sample from Nicole Brown looks slightly more degraded than the sample from Mr. Goldman. All of the samples of the knowns on this film um, and the TDS and the K562 appear to be rather dark, and they are. And the reason is that this was a, a long exposure because one of the evidence lanes didn't have very much DNA in it. Now, which lane was that? The lane that doesn't have very much DNA is the lane where we have sample number 52. And you can see how much lighter this banding pattern is as opposed to the others. Now, among all the various things that can determine whether something is light or something is dark, the overall most common reason is how much DNA is there. And we also know quantitative, well, in estimating from the mini gel that there wasn't a lot of DNA in that sample. Does the fact that some of these lanes are darker prevent you from being able to interpret the results? If we had just this film, uh, you, would in, you could interpret it, but I would rather see all the films in series and interpret them all together than just use this one. Um, the bioimage was used on this film. The sizes were done from this film. But any time that you have a whole set of data, you would like to look at the entire set before you come to a conclusion, not just look at a single film. Now, from looking at these, from looking at these particular samples, and let's let me focus your attention on what appear to be the three evidence items: number 52, the Bundy walkway; number 78, Mr. Goldman's boot; and number 12, the Rockingham foyer. What can you tell us about the relative amounts of DNA in those three items from this X-ray? From this film, number 12 would have the most in comparison to those three. Number 78 would have the sort of a middle amount, and number 52 would have the smallest amount of DNA. So from left to right on those three items, basically the DNA goes up in terms of its amount? Yes. Now, as far as once you obtained this particular x-ray, was it in fact examined for any results or interpretations that could be made? Yes, what it was. You, okay, what can you tell us about any conclusions or opinions you reached from this particular film? From this particular film, you can, let's look at each piece of evidence individually. Item 52 has three bands close to the top, another grouping of three bands, and a single band down here. And that pattern is consistent and looks to be the same as the pattern from Mr. Simpson, which also has three, a group of three, another group of three, and a single band down <coughs> at the bottom. And because, sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Because it also has the same pattern, let's go on to sample 12. It also has a group of three bands, another group of three bands, and a single band way down at the bottom. So the DNA banding pattern from item 52 and item 12 are I'm now speaking as if I was making an initial interpretation from this film. They're certainly consistent with the pattern from Mr. Simpson. Later on, after doing some measurements, you would make a determination that where you would say the patterns match or they do not match. But at this point, they're visibly uh, the same. All right, Dr. Cotton, what I'm going to ask you to do is, without wearing out your thumb, if you're using that to place the arrows, could you place the arrows on each of the bands you see in the Monday walkway lane, item number 52? Do you want each band, or should we do the two groups of three? Whichever's easiest. 
it's probably as as clearer it just to uh, relative positions. <clears throat> I'll just so we don't have too many arrows up here. I'll just point to the middle band in this group of three and the middle band in this group of three, just indicating that I have a group of three and a single band down here at the bottom. And I'll make the same designation for the, did you want me, I'm sorry. I'm, no, that's did fine. Did you want me to go on to number 12 or just? Yes, if you would. Okay. I'll make the same designation for the two groups of three bands in item number 12 and the single band down towards the bottom and the group of three from the known sample from Mr. Simpson, the second group of three and the single band down at the bottom. All right, Your Honor, then with the court's permission, I'd ask that this particular uh, X-ray film that has these arrows on it be printed and marked as a people's exhibit. Yes. Do you want to make that a separate exhibit, or do you want to make it a sub-exhibit under 257? The only hesitation I have as a sub-exhibit is there's already sub-exhibits to 257, but right. that may still be appropriate. 257A1. A1. All right. Would this be an appropriate point? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you. Do not conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. We'll stand in recess until 1 o'clock.